City at the A.C. Hughes residence on East African Road about Tony Clark and his family on March 20th, 1973. Tony, what was your father's name? Charles Foster Clark. Where was he born? Napanee, Ontario. When did he come to this country? How old was he when he came to he, this country? He was 18 when he came to this country. He must have come in 68, 1868. What was your mother's name before she was married? Julia Anna Whiting, born at Burnside, Michigan. Do you know the year? About 1858. Where did your mother meet your father? Must have been Capac. At Capac, Michigan? Uh, your mother and father were married about what year? Yeah, 1875, rather. Then the, they went to Cora, Michigan, by ox team, which took approximately two weeks, and farmed there for a while. From there, from there, they went to Colorado. Was there part of one year, and then went to out in Oregon and farmed there. Then your father was mainly a farmer most of the yes. time, most of his life he was a farmer in Ontonaga. That's right. And a woodworker and a mill worker. Oh. And a... Uh, now tell about the children. How many children were in your family? Beginning with... Uh, there was 13 all told. There seven boys and it must have been six girls and there was eleven my mother raised eleven and there is uh, the first child weighed about fourteen pounds that's right and the second child uh, that child was not named it died at birth that's right then the first living child lived about a, a year and some months. The first two, the first two died less than two years apiece, lived in less than two years apiece and passed away and were born, buried in Coral, Michigan. Then they moved to... Antonagan from Coral? No, they moved to Colorado. Oh, Colorado. Yeah, then from Colorado they moved to Ottenham. I see. And my dad built the home in Ottenham uh, with a $20 bill. And it's still standing and being occupied and you can't you can't tell it from the rest of the houses. Of course, it's been remodeled a little since. But he got most of the material from crates and piano boxes to build the house out of. Wooden crates that yes. things were shipped in? Yes, that's right. Did he have to cut any trees down to get the um, uh, any wood that way for two by fours? No. Then he sold that and moved out on a homestead at 14 Mile Point. Where is that? On a homestead. Where is that? That's out the lake shore, 14 oh. miles east of Ottenbog, towards Houghton. Oh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we was on the end of the road. The only way we got groceries in after deer season, my parents had a team of big dogs in a sleigh. They took the dog team and go to town 14 miles 
get their groceries, and they could take 200 pounds of flour on the dog, on, on the sleigh, and their other groceries, and the dogs would pull them back, but they'd have to help, they'd have to push on uphills. In the summer, the road was corduroy, and uh, in the spring the flood would come, and this corduroy logs who was driving over, they'd drive over, you know, would float out of place out in the swamp, and they'd have to pull them all back in July or August. Then you, you could get out with a horse for a couple or three months, and in deer season again the snow would come, and there's just a dog team from then on, unless you used a boat and went down Lake Superior. Did they ever use a boat to go shopping? Well, not that I know of. Then, uh, when was, um, what was the first child named that lived? Was that Charles? Yes, that was Charles and Tommy, and they lived uh, less than uh, two years apiece. James was the next one that lived uh, quite a while, and that was over 82 years. Oh, he was 82 when he died? Mm -hmm. And my, uh, my brother Johnny lived to be 57, and he lived in Minnesota all his life in the woods. He trapped in the summer, or in the winter, and was a commercial fisherman in the summer in a small way. Is he the one who married the Indian maiden? That's right. He had an Indian family of uh, four children. Uh, what tribe uh, was she from? Well, I couldn't tell you all right off hand. Oh. Mm -hmm. I had a sister, Almeida, which was a trained nurse. And she passed away in 1912. How old was she when she died? About 24, as, as I recall. Mm -hmm. And she died in Duluth, Minnesota. She had been working for a doctor. And uh, she went to California with the way I understand it. She went to California with the doctor's family and come back in the spring and took pneumonia and passed away. But when my, uh, when my youngest brother was born, she came home and took care of my mother. That's when Ted was born. And Ted weighed a pound and a half. Ted weighed a pound and a half when he was born. You could put him in a shoebox with his baby clothes on, the baby blanket around, around him, and put the cover on the shoebox. And all we had for incubator was setting that shoebox on the kitchen stove oven door to warm him up. That was a wood stove? Yes, a wood stove was right. Uh, did they have to feed him with an eyedropper, I suppose? Oh, I don't know. So tiny. I don't, I don't have any no. idea what you had him with. <laughs> no. My mother didn't know she had a baby for three months. Oh, she was she, unconscious? She was semi-conscious. -con For three months afterwards? Yes, three months. She didn't know she had a young tree. My goodness. And when she came out of that, she was all right? Well, she was... she got by all right. And when my brother Lee was born, there was nobody at the house at all. My dad went out to hunt up a midwife, mm -hmm. and before he got back with the neighbor woman, the baby of my brother was born, and my mother had him navel cut and tied, and his clothes on, had him dressed. Isn't that something? One time the doctor come out there, Dr. Nitteror from Omnogon in the winter, 14 miles with the horse and cutter, and the snow was deep, he could only come halfway. He took his snowshoes out of the cutter, tied the horse up to a tree, took the snowshoes out of the cutter, and come the other half away, which was about seven or eight miles on foot, to make a house call. 
I think the house call was two dollars. Isn't that rare? All right, um, that takes care of John and Leo, and now you have a sister. Well, I have a sister Elizabeth, better known as Bess. Oh. She is living now in Honolulu in a hospital and nursing home combination because her oldest boy is out in Honolulu. How old is she now? She is about 86 or 87. She's been in the nursing home about seven, eight, maybe more than that, years. And my son Louie and his wife was out there just a couple of weeks ago and visited her in Honolulu in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Then who was uh, the next one? Is that Jane? Yeah, my sister Jane was younger than Bess and she passed away about a year ago last fall, a year ago last fall. Oh, Jane did? Yes, in on And my sister Lila, I think she's 76, be 77 next birthday, and she is in nursing home now. Where is she? St. Ignace. At St. Ignace? Medicare facility. I see. And and Charles, my brother Charles, left home when he was 16. And he wrote to my sister Lila for one year. They corresponded back and forth and then he quit. And we didn't hear from him, nobody heard from him for 19 years. Finally, my mother got a letter, telegram, from a logging company in Long, Longview, Washington, I believe and uh, saying that he was injured in the camp, logging camp. Oh. The log hit him. Next day, we got another one saying he'd passed away. Oh. You don't know if he was married or not? No, he was single. He was single. Oh. And... My uh, brother Leo lives at Ottenoggin. And does, has done cement work mostly all of his life in Omnoggin and vicinity. And he told me less than a year ago there isn't a building in Omnoggin he hasn't worked on. Isn't that something? My brother Tom lives at Silver City. That's about 20 miles west of Omnoggin on the lake shore. Is that near White Pine? Yeah, that's, that's near White Pine Mine, and uh, he, he's a bricklayer or blocklayer, but he's, well, we're all retired now, semi-retired, let's put it that way. <laughs> yes. Now, out of all these children, how many are still living? What are the names of those still living? Well. Bessie, Lila, Leo, myself, which is Tony, and Tom, still living. How many did John have? John had uh, four, one boy and three girls. Bessie had two boys. Jane had three girls and three boys. Lila had one girl, Charlie none. Leo, three boys and one girl. Two boys, two boys and one girl. I had two boys and two girls. Tom had uh, two boys and six girls. Ted had none. That was quite a family. Um, now, in your family, you, um, how old were you? Uh, you mentioned a while ago, or yesterday when we were talking, 
about uh, going with your father up to Canada. What did you do? In I was 15 when I went to Western Canada with my dad. What uh, city did you go to in Canada? Well, near North Battleford to a place called Glenbush, Saskatchewan. Oh. He had a homestead. Mm -hmm. And it was 42 miles from railroad. Oh, my. And... Uh, did you go by train? <laughs> yes, to North Battleford. Mm -hmm. It took about four days and nights on the train. from Michigan. It did. And, uh, did you sit up all that time on the train? Well, we, no, we went to sleep in the seats. <laughs> <laughs> you had those seats that you could swing back and you could face each other. Yeah. And sleep, and you were four days going up there. Yeah. You yeah. must have been tired when you got there. Well, they, they stopped for putting her every place the farmer wanted some cattle or her feed let it put off or taken on. Oh. Well, how did you get your food on the train? Well, we packed the lunch. We packed the lunch from before we left Michigan and that went quite a ways and then we bought a little different places they stopped. Oh. We didn't uh, get off and it, go to any restaurant. Or oh, they had food on the train that you could buy? Yeah, a Like bit. sandwiches made up? Something on that order. Mm -hmm. And uh, the restaurants out there, out there in Saskatchewan at that time, the Greeks owned the better class restaurants, and the Chinamen owned and run the poor restaurants, which was a working man's restaurant. Oh. Well, when you got out there then, what did uh, you and your father do? Well, my dad batched, and I stayed there a little while, and then I went out and worked on different farms. Well, then after you got to tired of farming, uh, did you work in the um, woods? Well, yes, I worked on the farm in the, in the on farms in the summer, and then worked in logging camps in the winter. Oh, well, tell us about the logging camps and well, how you got there. One winter I walked a hundred miles for a job in the camp. And in the spring walked a hundred miles out of there. That's the only way of getting in or out of there. Well, did you walk a hundred miles in one day or two well, days? Twenty miles a day. The company had a place for you to eat dinner, a cook there and a cook shack in the dining room so you could sit down and eat your dinner. And then you had, that is 10 miles from the starting point. Then you eat your dinner and then you walk 10 miles more to the supper camp. Then they had a bunkhouse with beds in it or bunks and blankets. What time would you get up in the morning to start this trek? About 5, 530. Probably start by 6.30 or 7. It was pretty cold too, wasn't it? Well, it was often 50 below zero to work in the woods, and cold was no excuse for laying in the bunkhouse. If you laid in the bunkhouse and wasn't sick, you were fired. You got your time, and you walked out to 100 miles, and you carried your luggage. They didn't take it on the top team. You carried it out. And you, when, if you went out, you paid for each meal. They gave you, when you left the camp, they gave you a card. And each cook at each stopping place punched it for every meal you got when you went in the dining room. And you paid for a regular meal. Before the, when they cast your check, they added your card up your punching took that out of your money for they could pay you. How many men would be in one camp? There was 300 men in the camp and this company had eight camps along the Saskatchewan River. Oh. The town, the town where the, we started out from at the end of the railroad was the pass, Manitoba. Mm -hmm. We walked up the Saskatchewan River a hundred miles. 
About what time of year would this be? Well, it'll be in the September, I believe, when we went in. Mm -hmm. Well, would they, when you'd uh, get, what would you do, saw the logs by hand uh, in the woods? Yes, I was in the saw gang for a while. And I drove a skid team, skidding team for a while. Worked in a loading gang for a while. You do put in anything they ask you to. I sat, I sat by the foreman in the dining room. I sat by the foreman. His name was Long Tom Walker. <laughs> he used to chew Copenhagen while he was eating. He never spit it out. Oh. He kept it right in his mouth while he was eating his meals. Do you suppose he was related to Bert's people? <laughs> I don't know. Bert's mother's name. <laughs> Bert's mother's name is Walker. Margaret Walker. <laughs> well, and they came from Canada. Now this this <laughs> this camp I'm telling you about when we went out in the morning. One morning we went out. We had to cross the river to go to work. We crossed the river every morning to get on the logging road. And yeah, what would you get wet? No, on the ice. We were oh. about four foot of ice. And uh, we went out one morning and there was a hole in the ice where they'd cut the hole out to fill the water tank to make ice roads, like a paved road to haul their logs on. Oh, they would put the ice on the road? Yes. Mm -hmm. The water tank and six or eight horses would haul water all night and sprinkle on the logging roads. And that would freeze, see, and they'd build up about four foot of ice. And they'd cut ruts in it for their so sleigh runners couldn't get out. I never heard of that. Well, you we heard? went out. You knew we, that? We went out one morning, and there was a moose trying to get a drink in the night and slipped in head first, and it was just his hind end sticking out of the, the water or out of the hole. Or the ice was. Yeah, it was drowned there in the morning. We had to chase moose out of the road every morning because they had cut birch trees down to make firewood for the camp and they come in there to eat, to eat the buds, birch buds, uh -huh. in the night. And there'd probably be 10, 15, 20 moose to chase out of the road in the morning. And where we sat down to eat dinner, which was four miles or four and a half miles from where we started out in the morning? Yeah, from where the camp was. We had walked out before daylight at four and a half miles, and then we built a fire to keep warm so we wouldn't freeze until we got daylight enough to be safe to work. This is 50 degrees below zero. Yes. Well, then it, they'd send a bull cook out with a team of horses and lunch sleigh at noon or about noon, and he'd have four tanks. 30 gallon tanks on the sleigh and all the dishes, plates, and knives and forks and cups. Did you have big plates? Yeah, we tin, had big plates. Did you have tin plates or yes, tin? Yes, oh, tin plates. Oh, tin plates. They were like pie tins. Yeah, well, there was a long handle dipper about 30 inches long in each kettle, in each pot. Uh -huh. You'd dip in each pot you wanted and then put it on your plate. Uh -huh and go to the next one and take what you wanted and put on your plate. You never took your mitts off. You had two pair on, liners and pullovers. Oh. And you eat your dinner with your mitts on, and you, the gravy would freeze in two inches around the outside edge of your plate while you were eating your dinner. Oh, dear. And the fox had come there overnight after the scraps, and there'd just be thousands of fox tracks in the morning because that's the only place there for hundreds of miles there was any feed for them. Well then, how did he get his dishes washed? He'd just pile up these tins and... Oh, he'd just throw them into the sleigh and haul them back to camp. Would you have coffee to drink? Yeah, you could have coffee or tea, either one. Would you have any kind of dessert? No. Oh, you might have stewed prunes in camp, but not out there. Oh. But they hauled the potatoes in the camp in a big open box with a four-horse team. They hauled it a hundred miles up on the ice on the river in, in the winter. Yeah. 
40, 50, and sometimes 60 below zero. And then potatoes, they dump them out in a pile on the ground, just like a little mom in front of the cook shack. And they would be frozen Oh, still. they'd be frozen just like bullets. And the bull cook would come out and take enough in to cook and dump them in a pile of water and let them thaw out to peel. But when they boil them, when the cook would boil them, they'd mm -hmm. turn black yeah. and sweet, and just as though they was just loaded with sugar. And you, you wouldn't need them for a couple of weeks. But when you went without potatoes and any vegetable at all for so long, you start eating them when the potatoes and liked them. Well, I suppose that starch in the potatoes uh, was like sugar. Because sure. it does turn to sugar after a while. That's right. But black. <gasps> Black potatoes. What other vegetable did you have? We didn't have any other vegetables. Just potatoes and meat? That's right. And bread, pancakes, lots of ham and eggs. They get the jelly in a great big barrel. Oh. Maybe, well, a regular full-size barrel, maybe 50, 60 um. gallons. Yeah. Um. Well, did you have syrup? Oh, yes, sure. Maple syrup? No, no, not maple syrup. Carol syrup. Carol. Carol syrup. Homesteader's jam. Homesteader's <laughs> jam. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't no maple syrup from popple trees, and that's all there is out west, popple and willows. Oh, is that all? That's for sure. Yeah, that's true. I, I hope there's none of my family listening in on this. They'll think I'm stretching a little bit. I don't think so, because I've heard a lot of stories, and I've been in the woods, so I know. So it Bert, and he'll vouch that he can tell a few stories, too, out in the woods. You know, if you're, if you're out with a team of horses out west years ago, in the didn't have a rifle or a shotgun on the sleigh or wagon. A coyote or two might follow right behind you within a hundred feet for four or five hours. If you had a rifle or a shotgun with you, you couldn't see one all day long. They smelt the powder. Uh, can you explain that? Bert said they smelt the powder. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Well, I know in Rockland, the Cayutes used to come into town, you know, in the winter time when they got hungry right at the edge of town there. You could hear them crying. But what did you do for meat? What kind of meat did you have in this camp? Oh, we had good meat. They hauled in great big halves of beef. All the meat you could eat. There was no shortage of meat. You didn't eat any moose then? No. But uh, talking, to, talking about meat when I was with my dad on his homestead, it was a big rabbit track, and it went. This jack rabbit track went over a certain hill between my, my dad's place and the neighbors every day. We seen the track in the fresh snow, and uh, I said to my dad, "I'm I was 15, and I said to my dad, I'm going to try and catch that rabbit." And he says, "He's no good if you do catch him." Well, I said, "I just want to." See, I just want to see what he looks like, a rabbit that makes that big a track. Well, I set a track, a trap for him, and I put brush up. So he had to go through a certain spot over the hill that was brushy, but there was an open place there. And about three days later, we got about four inches of snow. And my dad went down there with a team of horses, and he seen where this trap toggled block was two foot long, green stick of a pop of wood, about three inches in diameter, or four. You see where that was drug across the road, you know. So he tied the team up to some brush and took after the rabbit. And he found him, he caught up to him, but the rabbit kicked so much my dad couldn't bring him back to the house to show me. So he killed him, and he brought him back then. 
And he says, here's your rabbit. What are you going to do with him? Well, I says, I'm going to dress him up and eat him. Well, my dad says, he's no good. Nobody eats jackrabbits. Well, I says, I'm going to try it anyway. I skinned him out, and I cased his hide on a board eight inches wide, and from his nose to the tip of his hind feet was five foot and eight inches. That rabbit made. He made all the fresh meat we could eat for a week. Was that good tasting meat? We enjoyed it. My dad never said after that that jackrabbits was no good. Why did he taste so good? Because he'd been living on the neighbor's grain stacks all winter. Ordinarily, what would a jackrabbit eat? Well, just wild grass and whatever he could find in the wild. That's the Bugs reason. And stuff. Ordinarily, then that that's why they wouldn't taste good. Eh? That's right. I see. Um, how long did you stay out in Canada with your father? About eight years. Oh, I stayed out there about eight years, but not that long with my father. Oh, what did you do after you left your father? I worked on different farms and in the woods and different jobs. How old were you when you came back then to this country, or did you come back here? Yeah, I come back here in about 1923. And where did you come to, Aunt Nogan? Yes, not directly, no. I came to, uh, I worked in Wisconsin in the Cedar Swamp one summer cutting short stuff. Oh. That's pulpwood and posts mm -hmm. and logs and hewing ties, railroad ties, one thing or another. Then you went out in Oregon. Yes. And that's where you met Sue. That's right. How long did you go with Sue? Probably a year or more, a year and a half. What was Sue's uh, mother's name? Her family name? Oh, Gilbo. Gilbo. Yeah. How many brothers and sisters did Sue have? Well, Sue had uh, three sisters, I think, and two brothers. Do they all live in Ontonagon? No. One sister lives in uh, Otsego, Michigan. What's her name? It's uh, Marion. Her name is Mrs. Fred Levine now. Oh, uh-huh. Did she have any children? She had one girl. Um, what was her name? Alfreda. Oh. Then... Did she have, well you said she had more than one sister, what was the other one's name? Well, one sister is Myrtle and lives in Flint. She's uh, Mrs. Lloyd Gerard. Did she have any children? Yes, she had uh, two boys. She has two boys. And then did uh, she have any relatives in Kalamazoo? Oh yes, but I, I don't know just, to, I don't know just what the relation is there. Oh, well then, did she have some brothers? She had, she has two brothers in North Northern. One's name is Lewis Gilbo, and one is... Uh, did he call him Duffy? I can't think of his first name. Duffy. Did they have any children? <laughs> oh, yes. Duffy has about six, and Lewis had, I think, six or seven. They're a nice family. And uh, she has a sister, Lucy, and uh, she married uh, a man by the name of Tom O'Brien and lost her husband a few years ago. And she lives in Ottawa. Did you get married in Ottawaagan? Yes, I was married in Ottawa. How long did you stay there before you came to Flint? Well, I think I worked there about two years in the paper mill. What did you do in the paper mill? Well, I'd done different jobs in the recovery room, and the last year I was there, I was foreman in the recovery room. Why did you decide to move to Flint? Well, I thought I was getting a, a bum deal. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> well, Sue had a sister living here, did she, when you moved here? No, no, she didn't. We had no relatives here. Then. Sue came first, and then her sister came. Yeah, yeah, her sister came several years after we was down there. I see. Seventy-one. I'll be seventy-two in May the fifth. Well, I was six years old when our home burned on the homestead. From there, we went to a place called the Yore place, and they had fifteen goats that went with the fire when my <laughs> father bought it. The school teacher boarded with us, and we ate goat meat all winter. We was uh, we got one pair of shoes if we were lucky for the year. We got them in about the first of November. Oh, the shoes or boots? Shoes. Well, they were about six inch tops. If they wore out, somebody nailed a pair of chunks of belt leather on there to make them last till spring. Well, in the fall when we didn't, when they hadn't bought the shoes yet, we'd have to go out in the pasture for the cows. We'd get out, we'd, there'd be a lot of heavy frost and sometimes snow on the ground. We'd, our feet would be bare and it'd be pretty cold by the time we got out to where the cows were. And when they'd get up after laying down all night, they had to do something. We'd stand in that to warm our feet up. You mean the cow pasties? Yes, we was bare feet, sure. Well, that warm our feet up and we was all set then when we got back to the of the house. <laughs> oh yes. So we didn't have a new pair of shoes every three weeks like kids do these days. <laughs> well maybe that. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have bathtubs in those days. <laughs> no, the water had to be hauled out of the well or a pail in the, in the bucket. Or open the bucket. <laughs> and you put it in a wash tub, didn't yes. you? Yes, our, our bathtub was a tin wash tub set up on two chairs. That's right. The smallest one in the family was put in the tub first, and then the next oldest one, and then the next oldest one, and then the next oldest one, and then the next oldest one. And then if, when they got big enough to dump the tub and haul fresh water, they was allowed to have clean water for their bath. If they hauled it themselves. Well, yeah, if they got, when they got big enough to haul their own water, they were allowed to dump the tub and, and get fresh water. But if you wasn't big enough to carry, to carry the tub out and dump it, you just had to take it no matter how thick it was. And how did they heat the water? On a tea kettle or wash boiler on, on the stove. A uh, copper boiler, probably. Copper yes. bottom wash boiler. Right. Or do you have about eight lids on the kitchen stove? Probably. And a water jacket on the a end? A reservoir, a reservoir. Yeah. Hanging on the end of the stove. That's right. Was there a warming oven up above? That's right. I was running a water in the overbox. I'd say about the 50 gallon. Oh, not the not on the stove there. No, on the back oh, of the Probably stove. 12 gallon. 12 the gallon. Boy on the stove, but the one, the tank that was behind the stove, they always had a tank hooked up yeah, behind the That was the later. Range. That was more modern. Oh, was that? Yeah, that tank was set on the floor behind the range. Yeah. Oh, that was later yeah, on. Yeah, that was about 20 years later. Oh, I see. Well, what kind of clothing did you wear in those days? Uh, I mean, how much did you get? Did you have long johns or? No. I guess we had clothing enough to keep warm most of the time. But when we went to school, we walked a mile and a half through the snow. And uh, there was eight grades in the one room, and the teacher taught, one teacher taught the eight grades, eight classes. And uh, the oldest one in the family went first when the snow was deep. He'd break the trail, of course, he'd take long steps. The little guys coming behind had to try and reach them steps. And they just didn't do it, that's all. So they had a lot of 
who are trail breaking to do of their own. And sometimes the older ones took extra long steps just to see the little guys struggle a little bit. It was survival of the fittest. Yes. Well, the first day I went to school, the, t the school teacher boarding at our house had to try to take care of me. I I woke up when all the other children was gone home and I was sitting on the teacher's lap. That was a good time. <laughs> oh, <bird. laughs> well, you went to a country school, Bert, didn't you? <laughs> did you ever have to fight the bully, Bert, did, in order to get rid of the well, then, then times if a, if a person went through the eighth grade, they could teach school for two years. That's true. Then they take a year of normal. I, I don't know how many years more they could teach. Well, they took six weeks normal and then they could go back teaching. Oh? Oh, yes. Just six weeks. Six weeks. In the summer. Uh-huh. And they take a test, and if they passed it, then they could teach another year or two. Uh, when it came to clothing, what would you have? Like a, a wool coat, or um, how much clothes a year would each one of you get? Well, like gee, a, I, I can't remember the clothes, but I, they, I do remember waking up lots of times and where the where the chicken was out between the logs in our where we slept upstairs, the snow would drift in across the top of our bed. It might be an inch of snow drift when there's a storm on. Oh, you had a log cabin? Yeah, at one time. Did you have a fireplace in the log cabin? No. No, we had a wood stove. Wood stove that took a single cord of wood a week to run that house on the the farm where we had the goats there. It took a single cord of wood to do it a week. And my brother Charlie, which was about, uh, he was about 12 years old, and Leo was about 10, 9 or 10, they had to go out and cut that on Saturday, the cord of maple, to run the house for the next week. And that was hardwood with uh, just an ordinary saw. That is a cross-cut saw in the next. In the next. And then you had the outdoor toilet, the chick sails. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big hole. <laughs> well, we had a well, too. The well was about 20 foot deep. And it was uh, dug. It was a dug well in a circle. And there was stones built up to hold the dirt from caving in. And every, uh, all the time there'd be little animals like frogs and once in a while a rat or a cat would fall in there and drown and of course they'd float for a while and then they'd sink to the bottom, you know, that would deteriorate in the bottom. And every two years we had to dip the water out of that well and, and take, and dip that other muck out too, them skeletons and hides and stuff. That had to come out too. So, I'd, we had a cat, and my dad wanted to get rid of it, and he promised my sister Lila 25 cents if she'd drown the cat. In the well? No, not in the well, <laughs> but if she drowned the cat. Mm -hmm. Well, she didn't, uh, she got rid of the cat some way, and, uh, but he never paid her the 25 cents. And he, put the ladder down the well and he went down there to scoop up that there and muck, you know, and skeletons mm -hmm. and stuff out of the bottom of the well. And uh, when he went down there, he handed the ladder back up to her and she was pulling the stuff up with a rope and a mm -hmm. bag and bucket. And when he got all done, when he got it all cleaned out, what he was going to, he said, well, Toots, he called her Toots. He says, Toots, Let's have the ladder. Well, she says, Dad, remember that quarter you promised me? He says, yes. Well, she says, toss the quarter out, and then I'll send the ladder down. 
<laughs> oh, dear. Well, did you ever have, uh, it, well, that's probably where the scarlet fever in those germs came from. Oh, probably. Those wells. Probably. What were some of the childhood diseases your family had? Oh, we had all of us going. We had all the diseases that was going. Typhoid? Yes. Scarlet fever, mumps, measles. You had scarlet fever. How many in your family had the scarlet fever? Well, I guess we was all, we was all down with it when we lived in Mount Noggin. I was the first one that got up over it. I got over it first. My mother sent me to town to get a dozen oranges to the store where we dealt. We didn't deal there, but she didn't give me any money because we run a bill in the one store. So I went to the other store and they had some oranges about as big as small grapefruit. And I told the storekeeper I wanted a dozen oranges and to charge it. He looked at me and he says, charge it to who? I says, to Mrs. Clark. Well, he says, okay. He charged the oranges. I took them on home. And uh, we enjoyed the oranges. But the other oranges where I was supposed to get them was only about as big as lemons and look all dried up. Mm -hmm. So. I thought I was doing pretty well. Oh, you were? <laughs> <laughs> to get all those oranges. My mother had probably had to work two days to pay for the dozen oranges. That's right. Well, in those days, bananas were sold by the dozen, too, not by the pound. Well, I'll tell you, I was eight years old before I seen an orange or a banana or ice cream. Oh, oh. And my brother Tom, the first ice cream cone he got, he wanted it warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cute. Oh. You made your own ice cream, though, did you, with a no, freezer? No, no, we didn't. No? And I do put out overnight the oven for the ice. Well, we didn't have refrigerators in those days. No. We used to have a window. Well, we had a root. We had a root house, and there was a little spring in the back end of the root house, and the water run used to run out right down the middle and run down the hill. My mother used to put the milk crocks, set them in that cold spring water, and then the, the cream would raise to the top, and she'd skim it off, you know, and, and make butter. But sometimes she'd go down there, and there'd be a hole in the cream. But that just meant there was a mouse grounded down in the milk where he fell through. Oh no. Sure. Well then would she use that? Uh... Well she'd just fish the mouse out by the tail like that and squeeze the cream off of it and throw him away. <laughs> oh no. And use the milk? Well, she, yeah. Made the, out of the milk after the cream was taken off, usually made Dutch cheese. Oh, and it's, it's better known as cottage cheese today. How did she make the Dutch cheese? She just put it in the pan and set it on the back part of the stove, the cooler part of the stove, for about two days. And the curds would form? Yes. They were big curds too, weren't they? It, it was better than what you can buy today. Thanks, Dick. Isn't it a wonder, though, that you survived with the mice and all <laughs> The rest of it. <laughs> Were you sleeping upstairs in this log cabin? Yes, it was a, it was a regular house, but the, the chicken was off between the logs close to my bed. And the snow used to drift in once in a while. And sometimes I could feel a mouse hopping across the blankets after I was in bed on top. The blankets was covering me. So one night I said I was, to myself, I was going to set a trap, and I knew the mouse was too small to get caught in their ordinary trap. So I set the trap, and I took a piece of black cloth, cloth, because it was night, you know, mm -hmm. and I thought he'd see a white cloth, so I used a black cloth. Mm -hmm. I spread that over the trap. Pretty soon the mouse come hopping along, and he hopped right on the pan of the trap, and the trap sprung shut. And that cloth made a pocket. He just sold right in there. Oh no! Yes. <laughs> and then he squealed. 
Yeah, but I got up. How'd you work? Oh, you have a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't make chop suey out of them, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, there's wasn't no chop suey them days around North Morgan. No. Well, when you went to school. What subjects did you take, you know, like when you were in the grade school? Well, we just took the regular subjects, reading, writing, arithmetic, spelling. And spelling? Yes. What time would you go to school in the morning? I think it was 8 or 8.30, maybe 9, maybe 9 o'clock. You know. And you'd carry a lunch? Oh, yes. Uh, sandwich, butter, bread and butter. Bread and butter. Sandwich. No jelly in it or. Oh, once in a while there'd be a little jelly, but we had one neighbor. I think he was Finnish, and them kids had lard on their bread instead of butter. Oh my! And we, we used to be jealous of. Them. And we, every once in a while, we'd coax them to trade a bread and butter sandwich for the lard sandwich. Oh, that thick lard. Yeah, the lard sandwich was a treat for us, and the butter sandwich was a treat for them, because they didn't see butter. Oh, no. They were Finnish children, were they? I think so. Well, you know why the Finns didn't have... Uh, they used to sell all the milk and cream, and that's why many of them developed TB because they were so undernourished. Are there many uh, Finnish people in your neighborhood? Oh yeah, there's, I would say 50% of the people in the Upper Peninsula are fin, Finnish. Oh. Did you do any fishing when you were little? Oh yes. How did you do it? From a boat or from the shore? Or? No, right. Right in the in the hay field, we could take a bent pin for a hook and a shingle nail for a sinker, and a white string off of a parcel from the store for a line, and cut a little willow or a birch stick, mm -hmm. and fish right in the creek running through the hay field. Oh. And a couple of kids get enough speckled trout in an hour to feed the family a good meal. And that was a delicious meal. Without getting out of sight of the house at all. How would you cook that fish? Prime. With lard? Yes. Did you raise any pigs on your little farm? No, but uh, I'll tell you, one, day, one time my dad come home from a logging camp and he brought a mare and two pigs. And he come home at night. The camp was breaking up and they was getting rid of the stock they had. Mm -hmm. He probably took it for his wages. <clears throat> I went out to barn, in the barn uh, to look at the pigs and I'd never seen any before. And they had their nose up, you know, looking up to see what I was bringing them. Mm -hmm. And I just seen them two round holes in their nose and I thought, how the heck can they eat potato peels with them? <laughs> <laughs> But they used to take the little tiny pigs and they would uh, cook them all in one piece, didn't they? Yeah, well, not to change the subject, but on this place where we had the goats, we had one old horse. He was a bronco. Mm -hmm. And uh, the kids what, was, What's a bronco? A bronco is a western horse, saddle horse. Oh. And uh, he was a good horse. And, He could jump over a six-foot fence if he seen anybody coming with a bridle. Oh. But if we wanted to catch him, we had to hold the bridle or holler behind us and a can of oats in front of us. Oh. And we could walk right up to him and catch him. But if he could see the rope, you know, or holler, we couldn't get within a mile of him. But the older brothers of mine were supposed to feed him at night and they forgot to. And he 
the hay hole was right over the manger from the, the loft of the barn. And the horse reared up with his front feet on the manger. And he was reaching up for the hay that was hanging down the, around the hay hole. And he got reached up too far and he fell over in the manger on his back. And his head was doubled over beside him like this. Well, my dad got him out of there. He heard noise and he went out there. And he got him out of the manger. He had to cut the manger out to get him out. And they got him up on a sling. And they held him up in a sling for about a week till he got his feet again. Mm -hmm. And he was a good horse afterwards, but he always looked back at you when you was driving him down the road. <laughs> he was like that. Uh -huh. He never looked ahead anymore. Well, could he turn his head? No, no, he couldn't turn his head. No. He, he got his neck kicked. That's mm -hmm. probably an hour, maybe a half hour, maybe two hours. No, who knows? How long he was in that manger with, mm -hmm. with his head doubled up again, his neck doubled on his open. He didn't need to put blinders on him. No. <laughs> <laughs> you have Tony? I had four. I had four. Two boys and two girls. The oldest one was a girl, Jeanette, and she's married to Wade Snyder. She has seven children, two boys and five girls. Louie has uh, six children. He has uh, two boys and four girls. And his wife's name is? His wife's name is uh, Leota. was Leota Weezer from 